said If anyone would come, come after me If anyone would come, come after me He must deny himself And take his cross up daily And follow, 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 follow me That's Luke chapter 9 verse 23 Then Jesus said If anyone would come, come after me If anyone would come, come after me He must deny himself And take his cross up daily And follow, 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 follow me That's Luke chapter 9 verse 23 Well, good morning. It's great to have you with us. Let's begin our time with a prayer. Dear Father God, help us to listen now to what you are like. Show us more of why following you is always the best way and help us to enjoy singing of you too. Amen. This is exciting. Okay, let's go. Um, God is um, just. Uh, God is amazing. God is ah love. Uh, God is good. Well, that was grace. <laughs> God is Holy Spirit. Uh, God is compassionate. That was creator. God <laughs> is infinite. Uh, God is wise. Good one. God is saviour. Uh, God is perfect. God is king. God is omniscient. That definitely wasn't it. <laughs> Overall, maybe? God is... Oh, father? I don't think that was it. God is eternal. Divine. Beautiful. Um, Trustworthy. Different. Teacher. Actually, it was. That was shepherd. Maybe actually not saviour. Uh, oh, God is Messiah. God is. What is N? Near. Yes. What was R? Reliable. I wasn't out, but. <laughs> I'm going to look it up. God is rock. rock. God is our rock. Oh. Did you notice what letters aren't there? They don't have the tricky letters, yeah. which is kind of good. Yes. And there's not an X. But today we're doing X. And uh, we've sort of had to cheat a little bit. So we're going to do God is exciting. See you in a minute. So God is exciting. He's in thunder and rain, the rough waves in the sea, and wild winds on a plain. God isn't just about the dull and quiet things, not that all quiet things are dull. Uh, think about all the amazing, creative, crazy things there are in the world. It, God, it, God loves to be uh, to surprise us, and there's so much that is exciting about God. And, uh, but what we wanted to think about today is actually how do we respond to God? Hands up if you might be watching the football later. I wonder uh, when, when, or if England score a goal, how might we react? We could kind of go, oh, that's interesting. Somebody from the England team has just kicked the ball with their foot and it has ended uh, in the back of the net. It went past the goalkeeper. Now that might all be true, but is that? I don't think that's what we'll do. Well, it's not just about the information, is it? We're going to be like, yeah, we'll probably be up on our feet. Oh my word. Probably be able to hear it, even if you're not watching it, from the other houses around you. What 
we found out about God, those words that Judah and I were trying to remember, is, is, is that he's exciting. We've learnt uh, all these different things and it's good to try and understand them in our head. In fact, you, that was understanding, I think. I don't know whether we remembered that. But um, it's how we respond to it. Do we just think God is divine? Okay. God is just. No. This verse from the Bible was written by somebody who was very, very excited. And you had some very exciting news. It's uh, spoken by Jesus' mother, Mary, when she found out that she was pregnant. And of course she was excited to be having a baby. But she was very excited about who he was. She said, with all my heart, I praise the Lord and I am glad because of God, my saviour. She wanted to shout out from the rooftops the news about Jesus. Now, I imagine there will be some people in the country who aren't at all interested in the football. And that's fine. They won't get excited about it. It depends, doesn't it, how important something is to us why we think it might be uh, good news for us. And the Bible is good news for everybody. And it is important. It's a rescue news. And, and God is so worth knowing and celebrating. And um, I just hope that some of these words that we've looked at and some of the things we do together as a church family will help you to feel excited about who God is, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I want us to walk with Jesus Christ all the day. i
give to him. He has conquered death. He is king of kings. Accept the joy that he brings to those who yield their lives to him. Oh, Holy Spirit of the Lord, enter now into this heart of mine. Take full control of my selfish will and make me holy Follow him, follow him, yield your life to him. He has conquered death. He is king of kings. Accept the joy that he brings to those who yield their lives to him. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for being who you are and making me as I am now, loved by you. Help us to remember what we have heard and live our lives your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I will give my love.
Well, good morning. I really hope, I hope you're well. I wonder what you'll be doing this evening. Yes, along with millions of others, uh, my family and I will be watching the football. And it's been, a, it's been an exciting journey through the Euros. We've been there for each of the England matches. But some of you will have no interest in the Euros at all. And England's success uh, won't mean anything to you. England might well fail at the last hurdle, we will see tonight. But will it change anything if they succeed? It'll be a, a big memory for some people. There'll be a, a certain uh, increasing spending on things. But what will really have been achieved? And, and actually, what's actually happened? In the media, there's been a lot of talk about the way that, that football has united the nation. But actually, that's only England, and only some people in England. The Scots have been rather disappointed, the Danes are disappointed, the Germans have been a bit grumpy. All kinds of, in fact, of the 20 nations involved, 19 will go away sad at the end, to some extent. Football is not what we need to unite us. Our football team may at least at times seem a little bit more like a family than a team, but they are just human. What have they actually achieved? Last week, uh, we saw in Ephesians 1 that God gives us more and more and more. And that his way of winning is including people, not excluding. And today we're going to see the way that uh, God breaks down barriers. That God breaks down barriers. He doesn't, his victory doesn't cause some people to feel left out. He breaks down barriers that were, were there before. And makes one that which, those which were apart. I'm going to begin our service now with uh, a prayer. It's the sixth Sunday after Trinity, the Sunday, and I'm going to read the Anglican Collect for the day. Let's pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen. Isn't that brilliant? That things we obtain through God's promises exceed even what we desire. And God gives it so graciously and generously to us. We're going to learn more about God's grace later on. But actually, as with all things, there's more of God to know than we do right now. And so we're going to begin with our first song, which is based on Ephesians 1 verse 18. Open the eyes of my heart. It's one we don't know so well, but Kat Cervantes is going to sing it for us. And I really hope you'll uh, get to know it and love it. We'll be, fine. we'll be singing it a bit more in the coming weeks as we continue to go through Ephesians. So let's stand and saying, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. Open the eyes of my heart, 
Some of the more we've learnt about God has been to do using our, our A to Z of God, thinking of, of words that we associate with him and what they mean for us. And we're now going to move on to the letter T, and uh, you'll see me somewhere else as we think about the letter T. Good morning. Well, we come to the letter T today as we go to our, to our A to Z of who God is. And there's a, a range of uh, words used to describe God coming up on the screen now. God, we learn in the Bible, is our tower. We run to him as a place of refuge. He is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He alone is true, true truth. He is truthful as well. All he says is true and wholesome, not part of the truth. Uh, he speaks truthfully. He is the God who is triumphant. In all the battles he faces, all ones that uh, he comes across, he is triumphant. Not triumphalistic, but he is triumphant. And he's a teacher, the one who makes know what he's like to us. He teaches us the truth, the way, the truth and the life. He is our, our talent giver. All we have comes from him. He gives us just what we need. He gives us church just what we need. He made us fly. It's flying around right now. He's our, our trainer. He uses all things to, to train us up in righteousness if we're his children. He is our tester. In fact, he will put us to the test, not in a tempting way, but actually to, to keep us going. It's like, a, like physical trainers do, to test our motivation, test our endurance. But he's always with us. He is, God is the ultimate treasure. And he treasures us. He wants us to be, him to be the treasure of our hearts. He's a transformer of hearts as well. He makes us more and more like Jesus by his Holy Spirit. And he is trustworthy. Worthy of putting our trust in more than anything else. There's one word though that's missing from that list of teaser. Maybe there's others you can think of, but the word I'm thinking of is, is the word tender. God is tender. The Bible speaks about him speaking tenderly to his people. And it speaks of Jesus growing up like a tender shoot. But also, in the words of Zechariah's song, Zechariah the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah says these words of, of John the Baptist. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Why? Because of the tender mercy of our God. The tender mercy of our God. God is tender to us when we fail. God is tender to us when we falter. God is tender to us when we come to him. He is not harsh. He is not forbearing. He is not telling us off. He is a tender, loving God. And it's that tender God I'm going to lead us in prayer to now. Oh Lord, we praise you for all that you are. We thank you for your tenderness to us, to your children. And we ask that your Holy Spirit in us would help us also to be tender and compassionate in all that we are and all that we say and all that we do, for the glory of your name. Amen. Well, back in here now, and our first Bible reading is from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, the words are on the screen. The reading is taken from the Gospel according to St John, chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. 
Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus is the good shepherd. His sheep hear his voice and obey. And we, by grace, are his sheep, which is wonderful. But at times we don't always obey. Sometimes we do stray. We need a shepherd to find us and bring us back. And part of that process is him showing us where we're wrong and bring us to say sorry. And we're going to therefore use the words of the confession coming up on the screen now to say sorry to God, for our, to ask for his kind, generous mercy. The mercy he laid down his life as the good shepherd to give for us so that we can be forgiven. Let's come then to our confession. Words coming up on the screen. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, may Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our next song celebrates that wonderful forgiveness of God. Only by grace can we enter, only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavour, but by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is both the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep, and he's the Lamb of God, who dies on our behalf. And it's by his death, by his grace, that we can be God's friends, God's family. Can we enter into his presence and blessings forever. Let's celebrate that now, as we stand to sing, Only by Grace. Only by grace can we enter Only by grace can we stand Not by our human endeavor But by the blood of the Lamb Into your presence you call us You call us to come 
into your presence you draw us and now by your grace we come now by your grace we come Lord if you mark our transgressions who would stand thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the transgressions who would stand thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb only by grace can we enter only by grace can we stand not by our human endeavor by the blood of the Lamb Into your presence you call us You call us to come Into your presence you draw us And now by your grace we come And now by your grace we come Let's declare our faith now together in thankfulness to God for who he is and what he's revealed himself about in the Bible. We're going to be using the Apostles' Creed in its responsive form. Words coming up on the screen. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let us express our faith as God's people together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Now, having said the Lord's Prayer, we're going to continue in a time of prayer led for us by Sylvia Edgar. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. Lord God, open the eyes of our hearts that we may worship and serve you with due reverence and awe. Loving Father, Lord of all nations, we pray for our world. We pray those who are in positions of authority would seek your wisdom and guidance. We pray to you for peace. Grant that love may replace hatred and harmony replace discord. 
Bless the churches that strive to preach and teach the good news of the gospel in places of conflict. Give them wisdom, faith, perseverance and courage. We also ask the same for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted and tortured because of their faith. May we all receive your grace to live in peace with one another, seeking only what is good and pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for our church leaders. We ask that they be inspired and upheld by your living spirit. We lift up to you Bishop James, Tudor, Joe and family and the ministry team. May we, the church family, support, love and encourage them. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that you would bless the work and workers in your church in our benefice. We pray that your Holy Spirit will give us guidance and blessings. As we gather for fellowship in our midweek, Sunday and online services, help us to be united in you, Lord, seeking to serve and love one another. And please help us to see ways that we can reach out to the communities around us. We pray for our new service, Follow, that the families that have expressed an interest will come along. And Lord, we pray that you would provide helpers and prayer support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for all who lovingly take care of those who are ill in their homes, in residential care and hospitals. We pray for all who need such care and rely on others' help. We bring to you those who are waiting for hospital appointments, also those who are undergoing treatment, those whose lives are darkened by pain and fear and the sorrow of bereavement. May they know the abundance of your peace, love and comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, as we start a new week, we need your help. We seek and ask for your Holy Spirit to come and fill us with your love and joy. And we ask that the fruits of the Spirit may be seen in us. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sylvia. Praying together and praying by ourselves are very good for our spiritual health. We are not spiritually healthy if we do not pray, because that means we think we can survive by ourselves. We are spiritually independent rather than being spiritually dependent. Now dependency between individuals uh, on the same level is often not very healthy but dependency on God is very healthy. It's good and right to say to our Heavenly Father, Lord I need you. Lord please help me. Lord I praise you. Lord please forgive me. God is the one who has to work in us and he's the one who's bringing his purposes to pass through us and so we want to say Lord your will be done in my life work in me what you want and this happens because of God's grace which he gives to us in Jesus because he makes us new creations we'll be hearing that more in our Bible passage second Bible passage in a moment 
Before that, though, we're going to sing, I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here, in the grace of God, I stand. And after that, uh, Tom and Henry will be reading Ephesians chapter 2 for us before um, Sue Ward brings more meaning to it, opens up for us as he preaches for us on Ephesians 2. Let's now stand and sing, I am a new creation. from Ephesians, made alive in Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we are dead into transitions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressing his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One in Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him 
we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him t you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come now to look in a little more detail at the second chapter of the letter of Paul to the young church at Ephesus, let's pause for a moment and ask our ever-present God to open the eyes of our hearts that we might hear his special messages for us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have put a hunger for yourself in our hearts which only you can satisfy. Please come now and take the words which you have given me and apply them to our hearts, mine as well, so that we might see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Amen. The young church at Ephesus, which had had the great privilege of not only being brought into being through Paul's teaching, preaching and care, had two major groups within it, which differed in tradition and in the practice of their faith. As is common in all cases where there is a split in preferences or loyalties, this had led to divisions and trouble. When I lived for a while in Liverpool, it mattered very much to the local people which football team you supported, and it was a risky thing to do to go into the town centre on a Saturday in either a red or a blue shirt, particularly if, like me, football was a bit of a closed book. My main concern was how many supporters would end up in A&E needing my professional skills in needlework. Us and them became issues which could potentially split families and often spilled over into workplace rivalry. Ah oh, well, that was the 60s we may say. But are we so very different now? So many conflicts stem from our sense of them being different from us. In Ephesus, Paul was finding a situation where Jewish Christians were focusing on matters arising from whether non-Jewish converts needed first to become Jewish before they were accepted as Christian brothers and sisters. Jewish Christians felt they had a big advantage in their new faith. After all, they had had centuries of tradition and worshipping the one true God behind them. <clears throat> who were these newcomers? People who had traditionally been excluded from the close relationship the Jews were sure they had with God. This belief led to all sorts of discrimination and accusation within the church fellowship. And it still does. Even today we see suspicion and unkindness flourishing within groups where two or more differing interpretations of the right way to do things exist. Down through the centuries, splits, hostility and anger have spread through the communities which claim to follow a Lord who cared enough for us that he was prepared to lay down his life to bring into being a new kind of follower a follower who is reconciled to those whose belief and practice may differ in detail from his own preferences, but who at the bottom is following the same Lord as best he can, who lives out in practice the peace which was Jesus' parting gift to us. And this is what Paul prescribed for the sickness that he sees in the church at Ephesus. Reconciliation God's way, not man's way, not papering over the cracks, not proclaiming our love and concern for our brothers and sisters whilst keeping our distance and wanting everything to continue as it always has. So how does Paul see this working out in practice? In the first half of chapter 2 up to verse 10, 
Paul shows the basis on which we can be reconciled. First, he shows that everyone, in this case, both Jewish traditionalists and new Gentile converts, start from the same place. We were all suffering from a fatal dose of the consequences of sin. It's easy to be seduced by the beauty of the language Paul uses and to miss the point. The message is a modern, highly idiomatic translation of the Bible. I don't always find the language sits well with me, but it can get through when the familiar words of the King James Version or the NIV fail to pierce my comfort zone. Chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. <clears throat> all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has got ready for us to do, work we'd better be doing. I'm just going to pick out one or two sentences here or else we'll be here all day. <clears throat> we did it all all of us doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We neither make nor save ourselves. In theory, we all know there's nothing in us that deserves God's great mercy and love. In practice, we like to kid ourselves that we're naturally nice people and that God agrees with our self-assessment. Paul disagrees. Every one of us without God is doomed. The nicest people get cancer or suffer fatal accidents just as often as those we consider less worthy or whose lifestyles don't measure up to the healthy living guidelines or simply people we don't feel comfortable with. But the truth is, we have all, in one way or another, challenged God's boundaries, failed to meet his standards. God knew this, and even before we came to seek him out and know him, he set up provision for us. By grace, not because we deserved it, to show his kindness and love for us, so that we could be the people we were created to be and do the things he created us to do. Then Paul explores why God did all this. In the letter to Titus, Paul reminded Titus that our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. That's all fine and dandy, but how does it work in practice? In the second part of chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, 11 to 22, Paul begins to address this problem. It starts, he says, with the fact that all of us, 
those who feel we are like the Jews adhering to traditional belief patterns and practices, and those who find themselves excluded by birth, by not knowing what is right, or by having deliberately or accidentally failed to do what is right. All of us can now come into a whole new relationship with God through what Christ achieved for us by his death and resurrection. <clears throat> he did this in two ways. He broke down the wall of hostility between groups, a picture that reminded Gentiles who had visited the temple that they weren't allowed into the closer relationship with God enjoyed by the Jews. He created new men, not improved versions of the old man, but a whole new sort of person. The new life we proclaim when we baptize new Christians is not a development of their old nature, created like the world, out of nothing. It is a whole new creation. The end result is that all of us are brought near. All of us are being built into a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. A place where those who are yet outsiders can come in and see what happens when new people, created by God, allow him to fulfil in them the purposes for which they were created. In the kingdom of heaven, of which the church is a foretaste, a work in progress, all groups have the same access to God. And there are no second class citizens. Each one is a child of God, travelling towards the day when what they will become will be revealed. I hope this has given you a taste of what the letter to the Ephesians Christians has in it for us today. It's a letter which repays rereading in a modern translation, if you prefer, and talking to your God and your brothers and sisters about what you find there. Let's pray. Lord, you promised to write your word in our hearts. And we ask now that you will indeed write something from this passage into each heart this morning, that we might be able to continue talking with you about it. Amen. Thank you, Sue. Well, it's great, isn't it, to be those who sit under God's living word and learn how he wants us to be, but also actually who he intends us to be. We don't just live from hand to mouth day to day. We have a goal, we have a vision. God is taking us forward to be united together under Christ Jesus. And that means it's not appropriate, is it, to be separate from one another if we're Christians. Reconciliation is so important and vital within the Church of Christ and important with that as well. I wonder if there's anyone who came to mind when you heard that. Not just two other people who you could help reconcile to one another, but people that you need to reconcile to. But you realise it's not okay now just to, to live at a distance, to bear those grudges, to hold those hurts. Who could you be reconciled with? And how can we as a church, as church families, be more and more living that reconciled life, enabling that in our communities as well? There is great hope, isn't there, and great opportunity that God gives us and he enables us by his spirit because we have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We're dwelt in by the spirit of God himself. Well, thank you so much for being with us then as we've worshipped uh, together online, even though we were apart. And it's so valued to have your prayers and your participation in our, our community. In a moment, I will have our closing prayer and the opportunity to sing again. Before that, though, please do, if you can, afterwards, join our Zoom, our virtual uh, fellowship afterwards. It's really um, a valuable time of sharing our thoughts, sharing our needs, sharing our prayer requests, knowing how we can best love one another and chewing over what we've heard in God's word. So coming up on the screen now is our closing prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. 
take us and use us to love and serve you and all people. Amen. And it's that serving uh, him and all people that we talk about uh, in our next uh, hymn, our closing song. For the healing to the nations we pray with one accord. And of course anything that we pray for is something we can be part of ourselves. Working for healing. Ultimately that healing of being made whole in Jesus. But also those very human relationships as well. Let's stand now and close our service as we sing together for the healings, the healing of the nations. Oh, 